Good morning. Um, certainly there's been a lot of discussion about the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission and as uh, Greg Lyman, I am a representative of the Natural Resources and land management division uh, for those that were expecting ellen nadison she sends her regrets she apologizes uh, she really wanted to be here but she did have another commitment today um, the natural uh, the natural resources and land management division is responsible for the management of the local watersheds about 60,000 uh, acres of uh, land in uh, both uh, alameda and uh, san mateo counties principally um, and these watersheds uh, are watersheds that have been uh, affected over time by early settlers and those that uh, were, you know, previous owners prior to the watershed, the water company owning them. Um, and so they, they did have a certain amount of disturbance and, and our restoration projects are trying to reverse that, uh, that work. So the uh, San Francisco public, you, uh, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission does do uh, three things. Uh, the little emblem here on the left side, you can see we do water, power, and wastewater. The power is generated for some of the public services in San Francisco, and uh, wastewater is for uh, San Francisco residents. Uh, however, the water group, uh, through the Hetch Hetchy Regional Water System, provides uh, 2.6 million customers with water in four Bay counties. and about a decade, a little over a decade ago, the, the Hetch Hetchy water uh, system uh, began an upgrade to make it more reliable um, because the system that's pictured here that goes from uh, Yosemite National Park to San Francisco was designed over 100 years ago. And some of the, some of the components had been in service for over 80 years. Uh, so it was, it was time to uh, upgrade the system and make it more reliable uh, because it does cross three faults, three active faults, the Hayward, the San Andreas, and the Calaveras faults. So $4.6 billion uh, voted in, in 2002, uh, generated 80 uh, projects. 16 of those projects were in the watershed and had the potential for disturbing uh, habitats that had reestablished since the previous uh, projects went through 80 to 100 years ago. These large diameter pipes here uh, are crossing the Calaveras Fault. And so this, this is the type of large infrastructure project that uh, we embarked on. Uh, another one is the Calaveras Dam. There, a dam was built there, uh, two previous dams were built there and we're replacing this dam. Uh, again, you can see uh, some of the, like the office trailers are here and you can see some office trailers and vehicles in here. So this uh, large infrastructure project uh, it had a large footprint. And when you have a large footprint in areas that are habitat for species, you have mitigation requirements. Uh, so we ended up with some very large restoration projects as part of our mitigation. Uh, and by uh, proposing and the agencies supporting mitigation near where the impacts are, we ended up using our watershed shown in, in green here. We start, we used our, our watersheds for the restoration and mitigation of these projects. Uh, almost 2,000 acres of our watershed, of our 60,000 acres that's pic pictured here, uh, is what we proposed as, as restoration projects. And our restoration projects generally were uh, were to again undo some of the things that had happened to the landscape over time. So we were removing non-native species such as eucalyptus, acacia, vinca, ivy. Um, in some areas orchard had existed and we we're undoing some of the orchard work. Um, and we were uh, in some locations the previous landowners had removed uh, habitat that we essentially were trying to restore. And we generally were trying to, to benefit key species like red-legged frog, tiger salamander, and the San Francisco garter snake. So at this location, uh, we uh, proposed, we took out a, a number of non-native trees and enlarged a wetland that had been uh, drained in its, uh, through the settlers, they had actually drained this to make it a field that was useful. Um, so we uh, essentially undid that by creating a, a wetland. And you can see we used uh, Junkus plugs to accelerate the, the restoration. 
Um, so our goal is to create habitats that are measurably successful and so that we can demonstrate that we've mitigated for project impacts and we are trying to plant things uh, to accelerate that. At this location, um, you can see we had both upland and wetland plants to plant. And each one of these different colored flags represents a different species that we put into our planting palette, all nursery grown. So you, you can see the wetland area uh, out here. And these gentlemen are putting in willow cuttings, willow stakes. Uh, so they're, they're in the process of installing willow stakes. So again, uh, we also were using div division and, and uh, willow cuttings to, to accelerate our uh, plantings. Another view of the same location, you can get a sense of the densities at which we are planting, uh, very large, uh, very uh, significant densities of these areas. Again, wetland area that we planted and, and some uplands. It's been talked about, San Antonio Creek. Uh, Ted had several photos of it. Um, and this is an area where we, it's a large project, almost two miles of creek restoration. Um, excluding cattle that had uh, decimated this area in by many landowners um, and planting almost 200,000 plugs and almost 200,000 container plants went in. Um, this is actually the same area that Ted showed, only he took the picture from the bridge side and I'm taking it from the other area. Again, trying to demonstrate the density of plantings. So plants uh, in the sonar tube, the tubes, approximately six foot on center and plugs 18 inches on center. So we have pretty significant uh, densities. Um, and when you start talking about that type of densities, overall in our 12 sites, we planted almost 150 acres. And we had almost a, over a half million uh, container plants uh, delivered to the watersheds. So that's the magnitude of what we've taken on as mitigation for the restoration, uh, mitigation for the capital improvement program. And it, it's quite a significant effort. And prior, as Ted said, we knew we had, uh, on the peninsula watershed, we knew we had uh, Phytophthora remorum issues. And as a water delivery company, we know about uh, snail infestations in drinking water systems. So we, we were very serious about trying to prevent uh, infestations in our restoration areas. So we, we developed a very tight, a zero tolerance specification, pest and pathogen free. Those are the words we put in our specifications. Um, and I will say that uh, it caused us to do things that you might not think about. Uh, heavy equipment, when it was delivered, was inspected. Any dirt, any vegetation matter on it, it was sent off site. We, zero tolerance. It, it, it essentially, uh, the, the contractors realized that they needed to take these things off and have them power washed prior to delivering them. Um, we've talked about the nursery inspections a little bit. We put in a pretty rigorous system. We provided the nurseries with protocols, uh, the Oregon Safe Production Manual for nursery protocols, and then we sent inspectors out to do periodic inspections of those sites so that we could determine that the nurseries were following those protocols. We received seed mixes. So for our grasslands and upland areas, seed mixes, we looked at the seed lots because one of the things we wanted, didn't want to do is, is introduce new weeds to our watersheds. Uh, so we were looking at seed lots. And the pest and pathogen free specification required us to bake our root wads to make sure that there were no wood bore pests or pathogens in the soil that was embedded in the, in the root material. So this nursery um, actually took a, dedicated a portion of their nursery and they installed uh, gravel layers and put in uh, ground cloth and separated the different uh, plants to promote positive drainage so that they wouldn't have cross-contamination. Uh, they did precautions of boot wash so that they would be sterilizing their, their boots as they went in and out of this uh, area that was dedicated for our plants. And they separated by species again to, and got them up onto pallets to, to make sure that there was, again, less cross-contamination. This nursery was inspected and, and you can see we looked at the roots. Um, so we were doing what we thought was the best management practices. 
Um, on the seeds, this is a, a, a seed lot, and if you're not familiar with it, this one has 99% purity and 96% germination, but it had uh, rescue grass, and, and my Latin's terrible, so I won't bother. It, and this was something that wasn't in our watershed, but it was known to be in Alameda County, and it's very uh, aggressive and very difficult to treat. So we rejected this seed lot and found other substitutes to, to provide uh, other sources and other seed lots to, to substitute. Root wads. We, I told you we baked our root wads. So we, the contractor actually procured large ovens so you can actually see this is a, a special um, container and on top you can see the heat unit that was installed to use uh, propane to heat the interior of this box. Uh, the, in, the air temperature inside was probably in excess of 180 degrees. But the goal was to get these logs uh, six inches into this logs at up to 140 degrees Fahrenheit for a minimum of 30 minutes. And the contractor could put two, maybe three, up to maybe five logs into it, into each container. And depending on the size of the log, it was taking between 24 and 30 hours per batch to, to reach the type of internal temperatures we, we wanted so that we would have confidence that the risk of a pathogen or a pest coming in was low. Yep. Yep. And despite all this, as you guys have heard, we got infected. Um, the phytophthora was detected at multiple sites. So not just San Antonio, as, as Ted alluded to in his uh, talk, we have it at multiple sites. 10 species. I think the list that uh, was shown up earlier only had 18 in California. So we've got quite a few of them. Um, obviously, you know, including uh, Phytophthora tentaculata. And uh, many nurseries were involved, so it's not just one source. We, we ultimately ended up uh, getting a number of different uh, nurseries that were involved. And as, you, as we've discussed, the significance is unknown. Um, our concern is that we've introduced a pathogen into the, the watershed that could decimate a whole ecosystem. And these watersheds are, are native habitats for endangered species that, we're, that we feel we're good stewards of trying to protect that habitat. And the risk of restoration, it, if this project, if these projects fail, it's to, to start over from scratch the mitigation for the capital improvement programs. And that mitigation was $45 million of implementation. So that's, that's, the, that's the big ticket price out there. Um, we've incurred testing and treatment costs. The contractor and the city costs are gonna exceed $700,000 at all of our sites. Um, and, and we're delaying the ability to achieve our restoration because we are now uh, taking some interesting precautions that I'm, new precautions that I'm gonna talk to you about. One of, the precautions, one of the things we're doing is treatment. So part of this, the major part of this cost, that 700,000 is, is on-site treatment. So at each one of our planting basins for Mimulus and Toyon, almost, almost 8,000 planting basins, um, we did some study and we, are, we are, are achieving favorable temperatures at a good depth, eight to 10 inches down. Uh, we are getting some favorable uh, temperatures. What you see is the, uh, the planting tube in the middle here, we've actually carved the top of it up and used it as a rigid uh, structure to anchor the corners of the uh, cloth, the plastic. This isn't common plastic. Uh, our study showed that actually this clear uh, nursery uh, plastic with a condensate, an anti-condensate film on one side actually had almost a 20% better solar transmission rate than anything else, so it's a dollar a square foot. The labor and materials to install this is between $40 and $50 per basin, and we're treating between 8,500 and 9,000 basins in our overall program. That's where a lot of the cost is coming from. 
We've changed over to a different seeding method going forward. Uh, as was just answered in a previous question, uh, seeds are unlikely to transmit uh, the, phyto the pathogens. Um, so we are collecting seeds. And instead of growing them in nurseries, we are uh, installing them directly. Nurseries are still involved. They're, they are the best qualified to collect the seeds and store them and stratify them and, and prepare them for the planting. So we are still doing uh, inspection, seed inspections, uh, but we're going forward. But it's it's not the, the solution. The solution would be to have uh, more nursery, you know, that can deliver good, clean material. So you're sitting back there thinking, oh, this isn't, you know, we, we should be able to do this. It's a costly venture. Um, I can tell you that our precautions, so the, the root wad clean, the root wad baking, the nursery inspections, the rejecting vehicles that were muddy or dirty, that probably increased our overall implementation cost by about 5%, two to two and a half million dollars. The testing and treatment, $700,000 and rising as we find potentially we may have to do more work. Um, we've in introduced interim precautions, uh, which is increasing the time to achieving our, our, our stated goal, which is to mitigate. And it's probably adding a year. And each year represents about $2 million of monitoring and maintenance uh, that we have to do. So we're looking at a significant cost in, uh, caused by delay. And as I said earlier, the restoration, uh, if it fails and we have to redo it, um, our total investment at this time is $45 million. And that's just implementation. There's soft costs, design costs, monitoring costs on top of that. So just the hardscape is $45 million. So that, that leads me to ask all of us to roll up our sleeves and start working on some solutions because it, it's, we need solutions in order for restoration, which is important, to go forward. So I, I would ask that we all work together to better to develop better specifications and protocols for the delivery of pest and pathogen free uh, plants and restoration materials. We talked about mulch earlier. Um, one of the things that we're doing now is we're requiring all mulch to be a basically a post consumer product. So redwood fences that come down in houses or other locations get ground up. And you know, we know that it was, yes, at one point a redwood tree, but it's been kiln dried at some point, and it's now being, uh, coming back as mulch. That we work together to develop more accurate, inexpensive, inexpensive and quick testing for materials to be delivered. I know we should all be investing in green pear farms, because that seemed to be very <laughs> useful. Uh, in January, when that Toyon was discovered and, and we delivered it to Ted's house, I think it was a Thursday afternoon, I got a phone call on Monday, and Ted said, that's really hot, meaning that it was, had a lot of uh, phytophthora on it. Now I know what he meant. The pear was brown. <laughs> that we worked together to develop a better understanding of the risk to native ecosystems. And on this regard, the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission is working with USDA and UC Berkeley to understand the risk of Phytophthora tentaculata on native riparian megafauna. So we're testing on uh, sycamore and oak. Um, Laura Sims and, and uh, Mateo are working on that. It's only a start to answering some of these questions and, and uh, hopefully we can all work together. And I wouldn't know anything without a lot of other people. Um, and so there's a lot of names up here, San Francisco Public Utilities Commission staff, uh, consultants that we've used throughout this process, agencies uh, that have been giving us direction and guidance. And frankly, we wouldn't have such a, a speedy uh, response to hopefully containing this and, and uh, limiting our risk without the help of our contractors. And so. Uh, I really wanted to thank them as well. So 